Welcome back everyone to the final installment in the Sansui Alpha 907MR restoration. I'm excited for this video. We're finally calibrating this thing and I can finally bring it back inside and start using it again. So there's a lot to do. I mean, as we've seen in previous videos, this is a complicated amplifier and insanely overbuilt. The downside or the good side to that, I don't know which way you want to look at it, is that it has a lot of adjustments, like a lot of adjustments. Most amplifiers, you've got like two adjustments per channel, sometimes only one. You know, you've got your bias and your DC offset usually per channel. It's That's two per channel. This has five adjustments per channel. So there's a lot we have to do and get right with this amplifier, which means that we need extra tools to get the job done as well. So I've got everything laid out here, ready to go. Some of it's new, some of it's been done just for this amplifier. We've got a set of multimeters here. These are just various ones I have. There's no, they all do the same thing. They can all be interchanged into their locations. I have my favorites, but we just need more than one multimeter to do this job in an efficient way. So that's why we have those here. Uh, we have a uh, thermometer, laser thermometer, just for checking some temperatures as we calibrate it. Um, we have an insulated screwdriver. You must have one of these for this amplifier. Well, I recommend it for any amplifier because uh, you need the shaft to be completely insulated so you don't touch something or short something together while you're playing around with trim pots and various things because... Um, some of the trim pots in this amp are really hard to get to, and the odds of you slipping and screwing something up are quite high. You must have one. So just put some shrink wrap over one, or a tube wrap, whatever they call it. It's up to you, but there's many ways to make your own insulated screwdriver. We have a load bank here. This has been rebuilt just for this amplifier. I would had a much smaller one before this, but this is the beast. 300 watts dissipation per channel. 600 watts total. This thing's got a lot of thermal mass. We should be able to dump a lot of heat into it for a significant period of time without any issues, without burning anything. Um, we have uh, some probes and stuff here. I made these uh, sort of wiring looms just for this amplifier so we can calibrate it. And these are going to plug in at the, the there's test points available. And so we can plug it in and then we've got like actual connectors that we just plug straight into the multimeters and it just makes things a bit quicker and a bit safer because we do not want to short things out or touch things that we're not supposed to do. So yeah, we've, we've got all that. And the reason why I've done it is because in this vertical configuration, sure, we can do all the adjustments, but it is not representative of where this amplifier will be once it's put back together. It, it will be horizontal, it will have all its covers on, which means the temperature will be different, which means the calibration will be different. And I don't like it with Sansui, unfortunately, how they've got all the test points at the bottom and all the adjustments at the top. So we can't we can't test things with it, with it horizontal because it's all blocked off. So I made these so I can feed them through the bottom cover and put all the covers back on Put it horizontal and we can continue to calibrate it in a position and a you know a configuration that is representative of how this unit will operate when it's brought back inside. So yeah, we have a lot to do, a lot of adjustments to go through, and we're gonna get started. We're just gonna start one step at a time. I'm gonna take you through them and show you them. I've been doing this for about a week now, just practicing and learning this amplifier because the service manual is utter garbage. All the wording in it and the test points are wrong or worded incorrectly, or they're missing steps or prerequisites. So take the service manual with a big grain of salt because it is not accurate. Yeah, um, I think we covered everything off. I think we're going to get started now. So we're going to move on to the first step in the calibration of this amplifier, which is the biasing. Now, before we uh, start the adjustments, I just want to go through a couple of basic settings that we need. 
So we've got the cover off, so it's a little bit tricky at the moment, but we want it on CD input and I am running it on balanced at the moment, which sort of bypasses all the tone controls and everything. You want the uh, volume turned all the way down for the beginning and the speakers enabled. So yeah, that's just sort of a, a baseline of what we're gonna be working with and we're gonna change a couple of settings when we get to the preamp. So yeah, just um, keep that in mind to make sure you set it up correctly before you start this process. Okay, so biasing. It's the first step that we need to do. Um, we're basically setting the idle current for the output transistors in the amplifier. It specifies 8.8 .8 millivolts for the the reading we're, we're targeting. Now, it, there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, there's posts from Japan that recommend 15 to 20 millivolts. So I'm not entirely sure what we're going to be using yet, but basically the higher the number the more power it's going to use and the hotter this unit is going to run because it basically makes the output switch on more when they're, when it's at an idle state. Now, you know, it, there's different ways to look at this. So you can either try and get more performance out of it at lower power levels or you can try to save the life of it by not generating too much heat. The way this unit came to me, it was set to around 20 millivolts already. So I don't know if someone's adjusted this or if the factory has been dialing that up. But yeah, it, it's um, still debatable about where we're going to end up with this. But we're going to be measuring it at 8.8 .8 millivolts, 15 millivolts and 20 millivolts. And then we're going to decide which one we're going to use going forward. Now, the test points, I've already plugged in my my cables, but they're basically just here. So there's test point here, test point here. So hot side, cold side. So they're your two areas that we have to adjust. Now, it's important to remember that this amplifier is not grounded in the traditional sense. The cold side is live and so is the hot side. So you cannot ground either of these with an oscilloscope, otherwise bad things happen. So yeah, we have to um, plug these in and then we can check our adjustment. I've already set sort of a base middle ground adjustment to get some heat into the amplifier and I'll overlay the um, the schematic or sort of the circuit, well, not circuit diagram, but the how it looks on the board so you can see it a bit clearer, but there's basically four trim pots in here that we're going to be adjusting and they are really hard to see and I can't show you them while I'm on this side of it. So we'll have to just work with that, that diagram sort of thing. Now you might be saying to yourself, 8.8 .8 millivolts seems incredibly low for an amp of this caliber. And you're sort of right if you just take it as a surface level reading and you think that's all there is to it. But it's actually way more complicated than that in reality. This um, test point is only reading across a single emitter resistor. And we have four emitter resistors per side, four outputs per side. When I say per side, I mean hot side and cold side of a single amp module. So there are eight emitter resistors across this module. And you have to times that, let's just say we get it perfect at 20 millivolts on hot side and cold side. You'd have to times that by eight to get the total amount of power that is going through these outputs at idle. So yeah, just keep that in mind. You're not dealing with just one value here. Now for our initial setup, you know, I'll overlay those trim pots again so you can have a look. And we are basically just going to tweak them a little bit to get it as close to 15 as possible. And it doesn't take much. Even with multi these new multi-turn trim pots, it's very, very finicky. And one of these trim pots is buried like right between two capacitors. So it's a struggle to get to and it's easy to knock it. It'll actually be a lot easier to do this once we get this amp horizontal and we're just looking down on it and I can show you some other adjustments, but we're just going to tweak these at the moment to get it in the ballpark. You can see how easy they just jump out of spec. 
So yeah, we're just gonna leave that there uh, as just an initial calibration. Now we are going to move on to the DC offset, which is way more interesting on this amplifier. Now the DC offset adjustment for this amplifier is quite interesting. It actually has two parts to it as opposed to just setting it to zero and that's it. We have to do um, two steps here. So basically there's the DC offset, which you normally have, but there's also another step we have to do beforehand, which is to balance the hot side and the cold sides um, DC offset. Now what will happen is if this isn't correct in the beginning, you know, you've got a value here of 220 millivolts-ish, and then we switch to the other one, and we've got like 30 millivolts. So, oh, well, one's almost in spec and one's way out of whack. What's going on? And you think that there's something wrong with one channel or something else is going on, and that, that's not what's actually happening here. So I sh should also mention, let me grab my non-conductive screwdriver, or pointy thing. Um, we have a test point here and a test point here. Those are the outputs for the channel, which go to the main speaker terminals on the back. So yeah, they're just little jumpers we can hook onto. Now, if we take a reading across both the hot side and cold side, we can see that there's 190 millivolts difference between them. So what will happen here is one side will be closer to the value and one side will be out by that much. So we have to adjust that balance to bring them within equilibrium or balance with each other. So we adjust this down with this trim pot and we get it like right on the money. We'll try to get this one as close as we can because this one shouldn't change too much with um, heat. That's been my experience anyway. Excellent, so we'll go with that. And that is between the hot side and cold side. Now, if we take this off and we move it back to the chassis ground, we can see that we're up to, you know, 135, 136. But if we jump to the other side, 135, 136. And they should be the same, which means that they are sort of balanced together. You can see that the off DC offset's still jumping, and that's what we're going to do in the next step. So I've given this amp a few minutes just to sort of stabilize after doing that DC offset balance adjustment, and everything's looking pretty good. It's holding pretty stable. So now we're going to do the normal DC offset adjustment, which is to connect one side to the chassis, and we can see we're still running in the 90s range. And I find this one jumps around a lot more. Um, technically, you only need to do one side, like hot side or cold side, pick your, pick your poison. But I still like to move between them just to make sure nothing else is drifting as we make this adjustment. So we go to the, um, the weird angled trim pot on the amp board. And we start... Wrong way, bringing it down. And this one I find is quite picky and this power save on this multimeter doing my head in. I wish I could turn that off, but you can't. All right, we're gonna let that be for now. Um, that's about as close as I can get it. It's jumping around a little bit at the moment. Now we have one DC offset adjustment left to do, and this time it's for the preamp. Now, the service manual is, I, I know I said it was garbage, but it's really garbage here. Like it doesn't describe this remotely right. There's a couple of things it gets right, but it doesn't have the prerequisites in there for how to figure out if this needs adjustment or not. Anyway, when we started this whole process, we had it on balanced inputs, which bypasses most of the preamp section. And it's, um, yeah, it's not going to give you the readings you're looking for to make the adjustment. If I turn this to maximum volume now, you can see there's not, there's a little bit happening. It's like a millivolt change, but we're not, it's nothing notable. If I switch this 
to integrated. And then I start turning the volume up. Now we're getting that real value that we need to adjust out of the preamp section. So we go back down, we go all the way back up and we can see, you know, 470 millivolts. If I switch this back to the balanced input, it's gone. So you need to keep that in mind to make sure you have the uh, preamp section set up correctly to do this adjustment. If you're not seeing any change, then odds are you've got the wrong settings, but you may already be within spec as well. It's hard to tell. So we'll put that back to where it needs to be. You also need to make sure you fit these uh, shorting jumpers, which are a little tricky to reach. I'll just grab one out, there we go. So they're basically, like the way I did it, I just grabbed some spare RCA connectors and shorted the signal pin to the ground. And then I can just plug these in to the back of the amplifier. And that does the job. And you can see that we're at 467. If I plug it in, it jumps about 10 millivolts. So you do need to fit these jumpers to get a correct reading. Now we're at max volume now. It's recommended to do it at minimum, maximum, and sort of 50%. What I'm gonna do now is I'll set it at maximum and then we'll have a look at the 50% the mark. I find this adjustment is too sensitive to really make a difference at two different places, but let's just see what happens. So we start to bring this down. So yeah, that's pretty good. Um, if we turn it down, we're looking at about four millivolts, roughly. If we turn it halfway. Yeah, I'm calling that good enough now. We'll adjust the rest of it once we've got it horizontal. But yeah, I just wanted to go over that as well. Um, that's pretty much all the adjustments we need to do. Now I'm gonna re- assemble this amplifier in some Frankenstein way so we can keep adjusting this thing with it in its normal position with all the colors on. Okay, been working at this for quite a while. Um, it's been about six hours. Just been putting the, you know, all the covers back on, been warming it up, been trying some different bias settings, seeing what I'm happy with. And I've decided on 15 millivolts being the final target for this amplifier. 8.8 .8 was fine, but yeah, I think it, it could be pushed a bit harder. We were looking at about 63-ish watts power consumption at idle at 8.8. .8. At 20 millivolts, we were up around the 93 watt mark and the temperatures were starting to get up there a bit, but still probably good enough, I think, that you could run it at that spec if you, had the, you weren't blocking this up, you had good ventilation and everything and you were willing to sacrifice a bit of longevity of components because it's going to run hotter which means capacitors will wear out quicker it's just the way this works but i took the middle ground and we, we've gone for 15 millivolts uh which is about as you can see here about 78 watts idle so it's sort of halfway in between the two two extremes and i think that's a good compromise in this case and yeah, I mean, it's drifting down a little bit now because uh, it's starting to cool down outside, but it's still within where I'm, where I'm happy with and I'm more concerned that it's stable or balanced between the hot side, cold side and between both channels. And we're pretty close, so I'm not going to touch it because then I have to redo all the adjustments for all four corners again, and I don't want to do that. The uh, DC offset is incredibly stable. Um, 
both sides are under a millivolt now and it's just sitting there it's been sitting there for hours and i'm happy with that um with the dc offset on the preamp where well i think i can still show you are we still hooked up yeah we're still um yeah not much you know a few millivolts if that and that's been pretty stable as well so i'm happy with that so yeah, I'm locking this in as the calibration 15 millivolt is the end for this. And we're going to hook up the load bank now and we're going to just hammer this thing a little bit and see, see what it does and hopefully not damage anything. So we've brought the amp up to about 35-ish, 40 watts a channel per the service manual. It's um, holding it there really nicely. Does not care at all, but it is getting hot <laughs> for sure. Pressed with my load bank as well, actually. It's um, sucking this up without any issues whatsoever. It's barely even getting warm. So I'm going to just let it sit here for, say, five minutes just to check for any issues. And then we're going to go for gold and find out how much power this thing can put out before it clips. Final benchmarking, we are putting out 200 watts a channel. <laughs> this thing is an absolute monster. Look at that power consumption. Wow. And here we are at a constant 100 watt load, roughly. Just, um... Keeping an eye on it, everything looks good. I can only do a single probe measurement because we can't ground this thing, but that's good enough. We can still see if it's clipping and there's no issues. So yeah, it is looking great. We've been holding 100 watts a channel for like five minutes and no issues at all. So I'm really happy with that. We're going to call this one here, let this thing cool down put it back together and close this project out. So here we are at the finish line. I'm glad to have this thing back together and I just feel privileged to be able to own something like this. Like this is Sansui at its best, probably the high watermark, I would say, before they completely disappeared as a brand. Well, the brand's still around, but the engineering isn't anymore. Um, yeah, it's just a fantastic piece, and I'm glad to have this in my collection. I hope these videos helped the community, because I couldn't find a lot of info on these units, especially, like, tearing them down and looking around inside them. And I'm glad I purchased this thing, and I'm looking forward to many years of just enjoying it, because I don't think anything's going to come along that's going to dethrone this in the the not too distant future it's just so special anyway hope you enjoyed the video i hope it helps some people if they manage to find one of these rare beasts and i will see you in the next video